Welcome back. The last time we talked about the eventful reign of the Emperor Alexius I. After the shattering defeat at Manzikert, he had rebuilt Byzantine power while being pressured from both the East and the West. The armies of the First Crusade had smoothly passed through his dominions, and though they hadn't kept their oaths about returning conquered territories back to Byzantium, they had at least weakened the Empire's eastern enemies. Alexius' successors, his son John the Beautiful and his grandson Manuel, had built on those accomplishments, restoring imperial prestige to a level not seen since the death of Basil II. By Manuel's death, the Byzantine Empire was seemingly at the height of its power, the unquestioned secular leader of the Christian world. The only troubling cloud on the horizon was its relationship with the Venetian Republic. Alexius, under threat from a Norman invasion, had granted Venice expansive trading rights within the empire in return for the use of her navy. He had tried to balance out Venice's growing power by offering similar concessions to Pisa and Genoa, the other Italian maritime republics. But Venetian influence continued to grow, and they soon had a virtual stranglehold on commerce within the empire. John the Beautiful had tried to break their power by refusing point-blank to renew his father's concessions, but his lack of an imperial navy and the spiraling costs made the resulting war not worth fighting. His son Manuel, inheriting the same situation, learned from his father's mistakes and approached Genoa and Pisa with lucrative trading offers. Then making sure he had their navies firmly behind him, he arrested every Venetian in the empire and confiscated their property. A high-powered Venetian delegation, led by the future doge Enrico Dandolo, was ignored and they were left to shake their fists in impotent fury at the Byzantine duplicity. It may have been a gratifying moment for the empire, but it turned out to be a Pyrrhic victory. Manuel didn't take the opportunity to build up the imperial navy, and the long-range effect of his actions was to earn the dangerous animosity of Venice without solving his foreign dependence on sea power and trade. But such concerns must have seemed insignificant to the citizens of Constantinople. Far more important to them was the fact that Manuel had married a woman from the West, Maria of Antioch. The emperor had always seemed just a little too interested in those far-off western lands and their barbaric customs. He'd even held jousting tournaments in the capital and scandalized the public by taking part in them himself. The people of the city had no desire to be ruled by a westerner, and when at Manuel's death the deeply unpopular Maria became regent for their eleven-year-old son Alexius II, the people of the city expected the worst. It didn't take long before their suspicions were confirmed. Venetian ships returned to ply the waters of the Bosphorus, their trading privileges restored, and both Italian and Frankish merchants began to once again choke off native Byzantine trade. When the people complained, Maria's government responded with increasing severity, riots broke out, and a wave of anti-Western feeling swept through Constantinople. This popular resentment soon reached the ears of a man living in comfortable exile on the rain-swept Black Sea coast, and in it he saw the perfect opportunity for a long-awaited attempt on the throne. His name was Andronicus, and though he had not yet earned the nickname the Terrible, he had by the time of Manuel's death cut a legendary swath through the matrons and daughters of at least three civilizations. A cousin of Manuel and a grandson of Alexius I, he looked every inch like an emperor, and despite a relatively advanced age of sixty-four, he was in magnificent shape. Dashing, eloquent, and at six foot four physically imposing, he had been banished by the emperor for carrying on a flagrant affair with his own niece. But most importantly, he was, unlike the foreign woman sitting on the throne, a true Byzantine, in whose veins flowed the imperial blood. His advance on Constantinople proved irresistible. People flocked out of their houses to cheer him as he marched. Armies sent against him defected without a fight, and riots broke out in his favor as he approached the city. Entering with virtually no opposition, he made his way to the marble tomb of Manuel and was heard to mutter that he would punish the man who exiled him by falling on his family like a lion pouncing on a large prey. The people cheered him to the echo, but with the reign of Andronicus, everything started to go wrong. He was a man of extremes. He had all the brilliance of his family, but none of the restraints. As a man of action, violence was the only way he knew how to deal with problems, and in a disturbing example of what was to come, he began his reign in blood. The Venetian problem that he had inherited was as bad as ever, and Andronicus solved it by massacring every Italian to be found in the city. Then he methodically started eliminating every rival claimant to the throne, 
in effect killing off anyone with a drop of Manuel's blood in their veins. Finally, it was the turn of the foreign-born regent, Empress Maria. He forced the young Alexius II to sign his own mother's death warrant, and then had himself crowned co-emperor. Two months later, claiming that two emperors were bad for morale, he had Alexius strangled and threw the body into the Bosphorus. A few weeks later, to complete the coup, he married the dead boy's 13-year-old widow. His next order of business was to attack corruption. Rooting out bribery and extortion, he impaled hundreds of offenders, regardless of their rank, and set their bodies outside of major cities as a warning. These shockingly brutal tactics were remarkably successful, and his laws, for all their severity, were just, and gave much-needed relief to the average Byzantine. The imperial coffers once again started to fill up, and some measure of prosperity returned. But predictably, Andronicus had gone too far. His reign of terror may have curtailed corruption, but it also resulted in plot after plot to overthrow him, and before long the mentally unbalanced emperor saw enemies in every shadow. He began attending the tortures of those who were captured, and took perverse pleasure from torturing them himself. The city was plunged into an orgy of blood and suspicion, and those who could fled to the west with horrifying tales of the emperor's bestial cruelty. Their most common destination was the kingdom of Sicily, whose Greek court welcomed them with open arms, and whose king, William the Good, asked nothing better than an invitation to expand his territory at the expense of the empire. Digging up a young man who claimed to be the murdered Alexius II, he gathered an army 80,000 strong and set sail. Byzantine resistance, such as it was, crumbled immediately, and within two months they had swept across the Balkans and arrived unopposed before the walls of Thessalonica, the second city of the empire. Andronicus sent word to the city to resist with all possible strength, but the incompetent governor had done absolutely nothing to prepare for a siege. Within a few days he had run out of arrows for the archers and stones for the catapults, and because he hadn't bothered to check the cisterns, the city soon ran out of water as well. After only nine days, a group of German mercenaries inside the city were bribed to open the gates, and the Sicilian army poured in, brutally sacking the city. The fall of Thessalonica spurred Andronicus into action. Not wanting to give any one general enough power to turn on him, he sent a total of five armies to block the Sicilian advance. Each of the generals, however, after seeing the size of the Sicilian army, decided that it would be wiser to retreat up into the hills and watch their enemies pass by unmolested. Back in the capital, Andronicus descended into a fit of paranoia and blood. A day on which he ordered no one's death, wrote a contemporary historian, was for him a day wasted. By September, with the Sicilians advancing on the capital, the western provinces in open revolt, and every man living in fear that he might be executed next, the population had had enough. A fortune teller had told Andronicus that his cousin Isaac Angelus would be his successor, and the furious emperor had given the order to have Isaac arrested and executed. Isaac hid in his house while his pursuers ransacked the courtyard, but then, figuring he was going to die anyway, he snuck into the stables, jumped onto a horse, and charged straight at the surprised men. Drawing his sword, he managed to kill one of them and scatter the rest before galloping to the Hagia Sophia. Knowing that even this sanctuary wasn't enough to keep them safe from the deranged emperor, he appealed to the congregation to help him. The news spread like wildfire, and the remaining nobility, knowing that they would be blamed regardless of how the situation resolved itself, rallied to Isaac. That night, a torch-lit procession was held in the great church. Isaac was crowned, and the next morning the crowd poured into the streets. They broke into the prisons, liberating the political prisoners, along with everyone else, and then headed for the imperial palace. The most spirited resistance came from Andronicus himself. He ordered his men to fire, and when they hesitated, he grabbed a bow for himself and started shooting wildly into the crowd. Realizing that it was too late, he ripped off his imperial insignia and dashed with his wife and favorite mistress into a waiting boat. Breaking into the palace only to find their quarry had escaped them, the furious mob ransacked the place, carrying off by one account over 1,500 pounds of gold and silver. Andronicus didn't get far. He was captured, bound in chains, and brought before Isaac. The new emperor was not in a forgiving mood. He cut off his right hand, gouged out his right eye, mounted him on a mangy camel, and delivered him to the mob. An eyewitness account records what happened next. They beat him, stoned him, goaded him with spikes, pelted him with filth. A woman of the streets poured boiling water on his head. 
Then, dragging him from the camel, they hung him up by his feet. He endured all these torments with incredible fortitude, speaking no other word among this demented crowd of his persecutors than, O Lord, have pity on me. Why dost thou trample on a poor reed that is already quite broken? His death was mourned by few of his citizens, and yet, in spite of his flaws, Andronicus at least had some redeeming virtues. The family that succeeded him on the throne, the Angeli, despite their name, had none, and brought only incompetence and ruination to the empire. But in the fall of 1185, with the tyrant dead and the tall 29-year-old Isaac II on the throne, the future looked bright. The Sicilian army was still advancing, but luck was with Isaac. He sent out an offer of peace to stall for time, and then recalled Andronicus's five armies and put them under the supreme command of the empire's ablest general. The effect on morale was electric. At last the defense of the realm was in the hands of men who were prepared to fight for it. The Sicilians, on the other hand, had grown overconfident. They had captured town after town with scarcely any effort. Armies sent against them had simply withdrawn to let them pass, and now the terrified emperor in Constantinople was offering them peace. If Thessalonica, the second city of the empire, had just taken nine days to fall, the capital itself should be scarcely any harder. By Christmas, they suspected, they would be ransacking the palaces of Constantinople. The Byzantine army swooped down on the advance guard of this undisciplined, overconfident group and chased them all the way back to their main camp. It was a minor victory, but seems to have completely demoralized the Sicilian army. Realizing that the throne of Byzantium was not such an easy prize after all, they lost heart and asked for a parley. The Byzantines, claiming that the resulting negotiation was just a Sicilian ruse, took the opportunity to attack the camp, catching the Sicilians completely by surprise. It was over almost before it had begun. Among the captives was the fake Alexius II, and when he was brought in chains to Constantinople, Isaac had his eyes gouged out, just in case. After congratulating himself on this somewhat less than honorable victory, Isaac used his increased prestige to marry the daughter of the Hungarian king, his most powerful neighbor. The lavish wedding that followed announced to the world that a new age of splendor had begun, and Isaac, now thoroughly enjoying himself on the throne, announced that the entire army was getting a hefty pay raise. More parties followed, but the brief honeymoon of Isaac's reign was over. His reckless spending had to be financed somehow, and his solution was to introduce new crushing taxes. When this failed to bring in enough revenue, he resorted, in the words of a contemporary, to selling government offices like vegetables in a market. Corruption, seemingly banished by Andronicus, came back in all its forms. Bribery and extortion became the norm, and even the army soon became demoralized as none of its promised funds arrived. The storm broke first in Bulgaria, where, angry at the weight of the new taxes, two noblemen announced the revival of the Bulgarian Empire. The first two commanders that Isaac sent to crush the revolt were dismal failures. The first one decided to rebel and march on Constantinople, while the second general followed the Bulgarian army up into the mountains and managed to get his army completely wiped out. When the third commander sent also decided to rebel and showed up outside the walls of Constantinople, something in Isaac snapped. When the pretender was killed, he had his head cut off and amused himself by kicking it around the palace, and then sent the mangled thing to the poor man's widow. After this unedifying display, he furiously set off at the head of another large army. But Isaac's luck had clearly deserted him, and the campaign was a disaster from the start. Unable to capture a city despite a siege of three months, he was ambushed on his return and barely escaped with his life. But the loss of the Balkans was the least of Isaac's worries, as just three years into his reign, devastating news came from the east. His Muslim enemies had declared jihad and invaded the Crusader states. Jerusalem had fallen. The news was greeted with horror in Europe. The Pope allegedly died of shock when he heard the news, and his successor immediately preached a new crusade. At least three kings, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of Germany, Philip Augustus of France, and Richard the Lionhearted of England, immediately declared themselves ready and willing to go and began mobilizing. The last thing Isaac needed, or was capable of handling, was a crusading army passing through his domains. Fortunately for him, the kings of England and France decided to sail to the Holy Land, thereby bypassing imperial lands altogether. But Frederick Barbarossa was another matter. Gathering an immense army, 150,000 strong, he made it clear that his intention was to pass through Constantinople. 
This was especially disturbing because Frederick was no friend to the empire. As the Holy Roman Emperor, he had himself crowned as King of the Romans, announcing with a wry glance in the direction of Constantinople that he was the only true emperor. His recent history with the empire was not likely to have improved his mood either. When the Italian cities rose in revolt against him, Byzantium had supported the rebels, and it had long been rumored that Frederick planned an invasion in retaliation. The Byzantines always suspected that the secret aim of every crusade was to conquer Constantinople, probably because the crusades by their very nature were alien to them. They had no concept of holy war, and were scandalized by the idea of priests, followers of the man of peace, preaching war and promising spiritual rewards for participating in it. As St. Basil of Caesarea, a 4th century Byzantine theologian, had preached, killing, though sometimes justified, could never be praiseworthy, let alone be grounds for the remission of sin. But even given this basic misunderstanding, Isaac could hardly have handled the situation worse. At first he sent ambassadors to Germany, promising to provide food and safe passage to the Crusaders. But as soon as the German army crossed into imperial territory, he completely lost his head. Evidently deciding that the crusade would be easier to handle if it was smaller, he cut off their food supply and attacked them. Then, when Frederick angrily sent ambassadors to Constantinople, Isaac had them arrested and threw them into prison. But if he thought to intimidate Frederick, he had disastrously underestimated the situation. This was no collection of disunited armies squabbling amongst themselves. It was a well-disciplined, fanatically loyal force led by a decisive emperor who was not amused. Frederick shot off letters to his son in Germany, ordering him to get papal blessings for a crusade against Byzantium. Then he turned his army loose on Thrace and occupied the city of Adrianople. Isaac had no choice but to give in. He released his prisoners and agreed with bad grace to transport them to Asia Minor as quickly as possible. The German army swept all before it as it advanced across Asia Minor and sent a tremor of fear across the occupied kingdom of Jerusalem. But Frederick never reached his goal. After he crossed the mountains onto the coastal plain of Seleucia in the heat of summer, he rode out ahead of his men and stopped to swim in the Chalcicadnus River. When his generals caught up to the spot, it was to find that he had drowned, and without him the immense army immediately disintegrated. The crusade had failed to retake Jerusalem, and the blame in the west, predictably, fell on the Byzantines. Isaac had antagonized the German emperor unnecessarily, impoverished and devastated his own lands, and far more disastrously, he had confirmed the West's deepest suspicions about Greek duplicity. Perhaps had the Third Crusade been a success, this would have been forgotten or at least mitigated, but in its failure, Western Europe saw Byzantium as the obvious scapegoat. Isaac, however, was not someone to let one disastrous foreign policy interfere with another, and ignoring the fiasco, he announced yet another offensive to retake Bulgaria. While waiting for the army to gather, he decided to go on a hunting expedition with his son, and in his absence, his older brother Alexius took the opportunity to depose him and crown himself as Alexius III. When the pair returned, Alexius threw them into prison and had Isaac blinded. Isaac was not one to inspire loyalty, and the people of Constantinople accepted the change in emperors with little more than a shrug, but it soon became clear that Alexius was, if anything, even worse. As he emptied the treasury, building gardens and throwing lavish parties, the Turks overran the eastern frontiers, Bulgaria ravaged as far as Macedonia and Thrace, and the army was neglected to the point of uselessness. Isaac's son Alexius Angelus somehow escaped from prison and headed west to drum up support to overthrow his uncle. He found it in the most unlikely of places, the Venetian Republic. The Doge of Venice at the time was a remarkable man named Enrico Dandolo, in his middle eighties, and completely blind, he had boundless energy and immense physical endurance for his age. He was also shrewd and calculating, and when the crusading leaders arrived at his doorstep to negotiate transport to the Holy Land, like flies arriving in a spider's web, they stood no chance against him. Determined to use the crusade for the benefit of Venice, he cleverly suggested that Cairo would be a much better initial target than Jerusalem. It was well known that when Richard the Lionhearted had left the Holy Land at the end of the Third Crusade, he had announced that Egypt was the weak point of the Muslim East, and all future crusades should be focused there. Dazzled by the wealth of Venice and the smoothness of Dandolo's arguments, the leaders soon agreed, and for an immense sum of money contracted transports for 34,000 men. But the old doge had no intention of attacking Egypt. 
At the same time he was concluding talks with the Crusaders, he had other representatives in Cairo discussing trade agreements and was vowing never to take part in any hostilities against Egypt. Just where he intended to divert the crusade, however, remained to be seen. When the news reached the rank and file of the crusading army that instead of Jerusalem they would be attacking Cairo, most of them abandoned the movement in disgust. The result was that when the army assembled in Venice in 1202, it was less than a third of the expected numbers, and much to the embarrassment of its leaders, it could not conceivably pay what was owed. Even worse, the Venetians refused to let even one ship set sail until the entire amount was paid, and were threatening to cut off the food supply to the army. The Crusaders were now the effective prisoners of Venice. Their leaders tried desperately to come up with the money, but even after they had reduced themselves to poverty and melted down every item of value that they owned, they could still produce less than half of what was owed. When Dandolo was convinced that he could squeeze no more money out of them, he arrived in their camp with a solution. Venice depended on the Dalmatian coast for timber, and it had recently come under the sway of the King of Hungary. If the Crusaders would simply consent to sacking its city of Zara, he would consider it a great service. The Pope, horrified that the Crusade would contemplate attacking the Christian Kingdom of Hungary, wrote a letter angrily forbidding them, but the Doge smoothly ignored it. And anyway, by now the Crusaders had no choice. The city was successfully stormed, and the loot was shared around and it was here that the doge met the escaped Alexius Angelus. Dandolo could scarcely believe his luck. Isaac's son was willing to promise anything to achieve the throne. In exchange for Venetian help, he promised to end the schism and reunite the Orthodox and Catholic churches, as well as pay the balance of the crusader debts, reward everyone lavishly, and provide military support for the crusade. Dandolo was probably well aware that Alexius Angelus could never fulfill these promises, but by now he had his eyes on a much bigger prize. Alexius was duly hailed emperor under the name Alexius IV, and the crusade set off for Constantinople. Once again the pope angrily objected and excommunicated the entire crusade, putting them all in a rather embarrassing situation, but Dandolo conveniently ignored it. Some of the crusaders were disgusted with the entire thing and headed for home, but most of them were only too happy to go along seduced by the prospect of rich rewards and a welcome rest before heading to Jerusalem. Alexius III, sitting in Constantinople, had of course done nothing to prepare his defenses. Even as the massive flotilla of Venetian ships sailed under the walls, astonishing the citizens before disembarking on the Asiatic shore, the emperor didn't lift a finger. The only thing stopping the fleet from sailing into the harbor itself was a great chain stretched across its mouth, anchored in a circular tower on the opposite shore. At last, when the crusaders advanced toward it, the emperor decided to rouse himself. Thinking that his mere presence would frighten off any invaders, he appeared with a large army to defend the tower. The crusaders lowered their lances, and at the first charge the Byzantine army fled, with the terrified emperor leading the way. The crusaders dismantled the chain and sailed into the imperial harbor in triumph, while Alexius, reasoning that he had done what he could, decided to wait behind his thick walls. Those land walls were almost impregnable, but the sea walls looking out over the harbor were considerably lower, and it was here that the Venetians concentrated their attack. At first the ferocious imperial Varangian guard beat back the crusaders, but surprisingly enough, it was the old doge himself who turned the tide of battle. Sailing his ship up to the base of the walls, the blind doge leapt to the sand and planted the banner of St. Mark's firmly on the beach. The crusaders, shamed that a blind old man was showing them up, surged forward and managed to capture a few towers as well as set fire to parts of the imperial palace. Alexius III knew that all was lost, and pausing only long enough to grab his favorite daughter and the palace treasure, he fled, leaving the rest of his family and the city to deal with the crisis on their own. His ministers quickly came to a decision. The crusaders had come to overthrow the usurper. If they restored Isaac, the rightful emperor, then perhaps the crusaders would leave. So the blind, aging ex-monarch was found in the dungeons and hastily recrowned. But eight years in a Byzantine dungeon had broken Isaac, and he was no longer mentally or physically capable of ruling. Clearly someone else had to be the effective ruler, and so reluctantly they accepted Alexius IV and crowned him alongside his father. The only thing left for Dandolo was to force Isaac to ratify his son's promises and then withdraw the army to await payment. Isaac broken as he was, understood the desperate financial situation of the empire. 
but was powerless and could only start an angry whispering campaign to undermine his son's credibility. But Alexius IV hardly needed help in that direction. After emptying what was left of the treasury and finding himself still far short of the promised sum, he resorted to the equally unpopular measures of crushing taxes and systematically stripping the churches of gold and silver plate to be melted down. By December, tensions were at the breaking point, and Alexius had lost the support of every possible ally. The crusaders who still hadn't been paid were growing dangerously restive. Alexius, it was presumed, had changed his mind and was reneging on his promises. The church was furious with him, both because he had stripped their valuables, and, as it was now generally known, he had promised to unite the eastern and western churches by making the orthodox subservient to the pope. Finally, and most damaging of all, he had lost the support of the populace, who blamed him for bringing the crusaders in the first place, and resented the crippling taxes that they knew full well would just go into the barbaric hands of their oppressors. Ironically, the stage was set for a war that neither side really wanted. The Byzantines just wanted these barbarians who were bleeding them white to leave, and would have been even happier if their silly emperor sailed with them. The crusaders, for their part, mainly just wanted to get on with the crusade and get to grips with their enemies. Only one thing kept them from striking camp and sailing away, Enrico Dandolo. By this time, repayment of the Venetian debt and a pet emperor were irrelevant. Why be content with whatever Alexius could scrape together when he could have the whole thing? So, refusing to give the much-desired order to sail, he began to work on the crusader leaders, regaling them with the dazzling wealth to be had in Constantinople. Alexius and Isaac, he pointed out, were faithless men who had broken their promises and needed to be overthrown. Once inside the city, they could set up one of their own on the throne and be able to pay off their debts almost without noticing it. Dandolo was a very persuasive man, and within a few weeks he had convinced the crusaders to overthrow the emperors, but at that moment, developments in the capital did his work for him. Just before Christmas, rioting had broken out in the city, and Alexius and his father, unable to control the situation, barricaded themselves in the imperial palace. A mob gathered inside the Hagia Sophia and declared both of them deposed, and then proceeded to elect another man as emperor, who, very sensibly given the situation, refused to accept the crown. Alexius, meanwhile, demonstrating the lack of understanding that had gotten him into this mess in the first place, decided once again to appeal to the Crusaders. He chose a man named Alexius Merzouflis, son-in-law of the previous emperor for the mission, and instructed him to beg the Crusaders for help. Merzouflis, perhaps the only effective player on the Byzantine stage at this point, had no intention of doing any such thing. Waiting till nightfall, he burst into the emperor's bedroom and breathlessly informed him that the mob was at the palace doors and offered to take him to safety. Throwing a blanket over the emperor's head, he led him to his conspirators, who tied him up and threw him into the dungeons where his father was already waiting for him. There in the dark, the Angeli emperors met their end. Alexius was strangled with a bowstring, and Isaac, old and broken, succumbed to poison. The two Angeli had presided over the virtual disintegration of Byzantium, and had done much to bring the once mighty empire to its knees. They were spared having to live to see the tragedy that was to come, but must receive their fair share of blame for it. It's hard to believe that even Andronicus the Terrible, for all his faults, would have fared as poorly. With the two emperors dead, Byzantium at last had an effective ruler. Merzouflis had himself crowned as Alexius V and breathed new life into the Byzantine spirit. The walls were repaired and manned properly, and the emperor seemed to be everywhere at once. By April 9, 1204, with the walls rising ever higher, the crusaders realized that the course of action the doge had been advocating for months was now the only way of getting their promised rewards. Confident of immediate victory, they launched an all-out attack against the vulnerable sea walls. But Merzouflis had done his work well, and the higher, better-manned walls enabled the defenders to push back the invaders. Three days later they attacked again, and this time managed to capture two towers and smash their way through one of the gates. Merzouflis galloped through the city, rallying troops to stop the flood, and furious house-to-house -house fighting managed to slow their advance but by nightfall he realized that the city was lost. Gathering up his wife and family, he fled the city to prepare a counterattack. The crusaders, for their part, camped out in one of the great squares of the city and set fire to some nearby houses to prevent a counterattack in the night. The blaze soon got out of hand and burned for the next two days. One French eyewitness, stunned by the sheer size of the Queen of Cities, reported that, there were more houses burnt in that fire than there are to be found in the three greatest cities of the Kingdom of France. 
By morning, the Crusaders awoke to find that all resistance was ended. The city was theirs. Most were not sure if they were in heaven or earth. Even with one-sixth of it burned from three great fires, it was still impossibly beautiful. Inviolate since the days of Constantine and the might of Rome, it was a treasure trove of sumptuous palaces, lavish basilicas, and all the art and learning of the ancient Greco-Roman world. It was all that they had dreamt of and more, and they fell on it like locusts, each soldier scrambling to grab as much of it as possible. For three horrible days they carried out an orgy of destruction, smashing and burning, raping and murdering, hacking apart anything that caught their eye. When at last they stopped, the sacked city was a smoking ruin, unrecognizable to its former residents. So much treasure, one Frenchman boasted, had never been gained in any city since the creation of the world. The sheer volume of melted gold and silver was enough to astound the Westerners. One breathless account estimated that two-thirds of all the wealth of the world had been in the city, and the Venetians carted most of their share off to decorate the Basilica of San Marco on the Venetian lagoon. The Crusaders never reached the Holy Land. Instead, they set up a Latin empire on the ruins of Constantinople. Alexius Merzouflis was captured and flung from the top of the Theodosian column in the Hippodrome, but the Byzantine Empire survived in exile. Sixty years later, it managed to recapture Constantinople and put the pathetic Latin Empire out of its misery. But the damage was done, and the city never really recovered. A pale shadow of its former self, the dilapidated houses were left rotting where they stood, and two centuries later there were still farms within the walls where there had once been a bustling metropolis. Economically devastated, shorn of most of its territory and resources, the shrunken empire was powerless to resist the rising Ottoman tide. In the two centuries to come, there would be plenty of strong leaders, and with a healthy, vibrant empire, they might have been able to halt the Turkish advance. Instead, they could only watch as the inevitable end came steadily nearer. As one historian has noted, there are few greater ironies in history than the fact that the fate of Eastern Christendom should have been sealed and half of Europe condemned to some 500 years of Muslim rule by men who fought under the banner of the cross. Doge Enrico Dandolo, who more than anyone else was responsible for the fiasco, was buried in the Hagia Sophia, and it's fitting that in 1453, the Turks who had conquered the city, wanting to desecrate the church, mistook his tomb for that of a saint and threw his bones to the dogs. Join me next time as I look at the life of Constantine XI, last of the Byzantine emperors, whose refusal to surrender in the face of hopeless odds, and whose magnificent defense of Constantinople, earned him undying fame as both an unofficial saint and as the first